Welcome to Identity Church Sunday Morning Message, where our sonship is revealed. Stay tuned at the end of this message to receive more information about resources available through Identity Church. Now grab your Bible, sit back, and enjoy a message from Identity Church that is already in progress. Are you guys ready? <clears throat> let me uh, let me kind of put some plugs in here. If you notice that when God we came into 2018, God did something and He didn't even let me in the pulpit for 70 days because God was doing something. It was a it was an epic season shift, and that was really really interesting to me. Because I can really prophetically get deep and find some really good stuff to preach about and look really good. And then God says, okay, bye. The way, go back to the basics. Preach on Romans 6. Preach on Romans 7. But God, don't you know I have all this prophetic stuff? He says, listen, this, the, the, our church has got to make sure the basics are right. Okay? And, and the first five books of Romans talks about grace, 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 grace. The six Chapter of Romans is die, die, die. 18 times, he says die. 18 times, die. So, so how are we going to live this Christian life? Dead, with him alive in us. Okay, so, so last week I, I preached on, on you know, uh, sin. You're free from sin. He, he did not, you know, he, he didn't take you out of sin. He took sin out of you. That's that's the statement. This week, we're going to find out that we're free from the law. Uh Uh-oh. You mean the holy law? Yeah, we're free from that. Uh, God is is dealing with the basics of our our faith. Um, And and God says, listen, um, you guys are a family. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know, kind of like mine. You know, there's, there's, there's some stuff goes on in families. And so that's what God says. Like, I want Mike and Lisa to preach on family dynamics. Let me tell you something. I see things in Scripture. If, if God wanted something other than a family, he would have called himself something other than father. Okay, so, so you've got to deal with each other, your husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, good ones, bad ones, whatever. They're still, we're still family. And I saw something in Scripture with Miriam, the older brother of Moses, uh, older sister of Moses. And Aaron, the older brother of Moses. And here Aaron's the chosen, I mean, uh, Moses is the chosen one. Aaron is, is told by God to be Moses' prophet. But Miriam is God's prophet. And I, and I, I have this, my, my brain goes into, oh my gosh, I always thought Miriam was, was, was in rebellion. No, she wasn't. She's the older sister who knows everything. I mean, listen, can you imagine Miriam serving Moses and she says things like, do you think you're the only one that can hear God? Don't you know when I was 12, I heard God and I floated your little butt down the Nile River and you got adopted and I got mom hired to breastfeed you? Don't you know you're not the only one that can hear God? Well, we got family stuff going on with my dad. He, 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 he doesn't want to go to rehab. <laughs> His heart won't work. Oh, and I have some sisters. And you know what? They think they can hear God as well as me. And they like to tell me so. But someone has to lead when there's a family crisis. Someone has to yield or your crisis will become even worse. These are family dynamics. So, so God says, let Mike and Lisa preach on family dynamics. I'm like, have you seen my family? I could do a better job than them because we're like dysfunctional. <laughs> and he goes, well, so is this church. Oh, that was good. Come on. It's time. It's time to get serious. It's time to go out in the woodshed with your brother and say, do you want to fight about this? Because I'm tired of tolerating you. How many got brothers that that you just need to go out and whoop once in a while or be whooped by? Okay, now that we got this figured, uh, we got brothers here? You two need to settle down right now. I can can see it. (laughs) But listen, sometimes, you you know, so we had, (laughs) what was that? Susie can whoop her brother. <laughs> but, you know, it was funny. Is, is one of my sisters said to, you know, how come my father doesn't get nasty with me or Susie? 
And he's kind of gets nasty with the other ones. As soon as he's like, I'll pull the plug on him and he knows it. <laughs> you know, there's boundaries. There's, there's all this family dynamic going on. But we're all concerned about the father. Well, your father's concerned about you. And th th the thing is, is that God has, God has burst some stuff in me. I mean, Gary, Gary will tell you, I was on Romans, what, how many weeks? Weeks and weeks and weeks on Romans. One through five, six, seven, eight, Roman, and, and, and he's got me back in it. Let me tell you what he's done this time. He's got me back in it on a PowerPoint because I'm trying to make a visual. This is the foundations. Last week, we talked about he took sin out of you. You're not a sinner saved by grace. You're a saint who used to be a sinner, but you're a saint. You are not what the enemy keeps trying to tell you. You're not what your older sister keeps trying to tell you. You're not what you keep saying about yourself. And I put something out the other day. If self-criticism worked, I'd be perfect by now. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. I'm going to go down to the bottom of the chapter, then I'm going to come up. i got 52 slides, and I have to be in Chicago uh, this afternoon, so we, gonna, we got your shoes on, your running shoes on. Are you all ready? All right. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. <laughs> and what are we saying? I am good, good. That is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil that I do not want to do, I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. What did we say last week? It's, it's not there. So I find it to be a law that when I do want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So so when I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Listen, last week we dealt with our identity and, and, and how we're a new person in Christ Jesus. We are a new person. God did not come to improve you. He, he did not come to fix anyone. He came to kill you <laughs> and resurrect you from the dead. Listen, some of us just don't die well. Lord said to me, your greatest strength is that you are pretty, pretty tenacious, Charlie. You have, you have, she said, you have some chutzpah, but the problem is also your weakness. You surely, you surely, in some people's eyes, are stubborn. <clears throat> in some ways, I consider you stiff-necked. Hmm. You're no longer a sinful nature. You no longer have a sinful nature. It's not just that God helps us to be a little bit better. He turns us into a totally new person. We are now something different than we were before. By the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ joins himself to us, and we are now progressively increasing in the conformity of the image of Christ. If that is the case, then how on earth did Paul come up with this chapter? Far too many believers make this section of Scripture their life text. Listen, I've preached this yo-yo message. I've preached the two-dog message. I have a good dog and a bad dog. Which one wins? The one I feed. Listen, kill the stinking dog. There's no dogs. They're dead. We blame our old nature, and it's not supposed to be there. We use our old nature as an excuse for not walking in who God said we are. Was Paul describing a condition of someone who was not yet born again? Or was he saying that, that even mature Christians are doomed to live a, a schizophrenic where part of us want to serve God and part of us wants to serve the devil? Listen, this is yo-yo Christianity. It's got to stop. He was talking about the, impo the, about the impossibility of serving God in your own power, whether lost or saved. Here's the issue. If you won't die, if you won't die, you're not doing it in his power. This is the issue is where is your source? 
In Romans 6, we, we see that we are free from sin. In this chapter, we're going to see that we are free from the law. Listen, the law will always be there, and the law will always do its job if we let it. The law will always tell you you're not good enough, and you should tell the law, oh, I, don't, I met this man named Jesus. The law is always going to be there. The problem is you're supposed to be dead, and the law is not supposed to rule over you. Even as the, the law works with someone before they came to Christ to point out their need for Christ. The law told sinners they needed Christ. The law tells Christians that you can't do it on your own. The law continues to drive the Christian to see that in ourselves we are utterly helpless. Helpless. That we are completely weak and unable to obey the law perfectly. Because it is only at this point we can rest completely in Christ. Um, 18 times, die. If I think I have a, an iota of strength in myself, <laughs> in this life, to live in this life, then I will con concentrate on that little ounce of strength. It'll turn into pride. It'll turn into self-ambition. It'll turn into unrighteousness if there's a dot or a tittle of it. And listen, I, I, I can be humble when I need to be, but there's times where it's like, well, I did that. Don't you know God sent me and I did that? When I know there is nothing left in me that can live this life, then I will be forced to rest completely in Jesus Christ. Listen, do you understand the gospel is about Jesus Christ? That's good. When we talk about the law, let's remember what we mean by this. The law, of course, is summed up in the Ten Commandments. The very term law means that God is requiring something of me. That's what law does. If there is a law of the land, then it means that the land is requiring me to do something. God's law means that God is requiring something of us. Or, or could we say that the law implies that doing on my part of certain rules that I have to, be, that I have to keep? So every, every time you read the law, you are thinking, thinking of your part of what you have to do. So when you read, thou shalt not bear false witness, it comes back to you and says, you must not lie. You must tell the truth. The world, the, the world of the law is you must, you should, you ought, you shall, you shall not. The whole principle of the law is God requiring that you and I do something. This is what the law is doing. Listen, I'm going to get free from that rascal. I'm preaching this, I'm teaching this, I'm walking this, and let me tell you what happens. Something happens down in Fort Pierce, and, 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 and I have a sister going to see my dad and, and, and the older control, for, I mean, the, 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 the mature sister, and I feel like I need to be there. I feel like my dad needs me. Why? Why, why did I feel that way? Susie packed my bags. I'm heading out. I get... I get all the way on 95, and I hear the Holy Spirit say to me, why are you going? Because I'm needed. No, you're not. Your sister's going. You know why you're going? Because you're still performing to do something. You're actually not, you're wanting your father to be pleased with you. Oh, it's a good thing. No, you have a sister that's doing it. Why? why? What? It, 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 and I'm like, oh, what do you want me to do? He says, go home. Spend the day with your wife. A 21-mile bike ride later. <laughs> She'll never hear the end of that. You're right. She, she actually told me that I'm losing, that, you know, at 10 miles out, she's saying I was getting slow. I'm like, that's 10 miles back, woman. And, and I know she does 30 miles. I don't. I don't like it. I even had bike shorts on. It didn't help. padded ones when we first come to christ in those early moments when i moved out of the old age to come into the new age in that moment i knew helplessness listen do you remember when you came to christ and all of a sudden the sin was removed the the, the freedom came and you, you you put your complete trust in him 
I have, I have faced the wrath of God against my sin. I have said that it is just holy, righteous wrath. I could do nothing. Christ has done all. And so I helplessly received Christ's salvation. That's how we all came to him. I cast myself upon God's salvation. And now at the moment, we know helplessness. Remember those days where it was just, he's everything, I'm nothing, and there's nothing I could do to please him because he's already pleased with me, and his love is just, ba his love is just basking all over you. And then somehow I rapidly lose the sense of helplessness because I become a control freak. The honeymoon's over. I'll take over, Jesus. When we stand in grace now, we know that we are free from the power of sin. We look at the grace of God and we are overwhelmed by the glorious grace of God. We are overwhelmed that we are freed. We have freedom in Christ. Around us, within us, there is a desire to please God. That's natural. Listen to me. There's a fine line here. After all that he has done for us, we lay down our lives for him. After all he's done for us, we lay down our lives for him. But here's the problem. I remember when I was a little boy, I would hear preaching of those very words. After all Jesus has done for you, the least you can do is do this, whatever it is. Uh, I was going to be a missionary to Africa. I, made, I came and answered the missionary call to go to Africa. Thank you, Jesus, for not listening to everything I said. Why? Because it, it, yeah, now Dan has to go in my place because we're connected. <laughs> Karen Simmons, go to Haiti on my behalf. Thank you. <laughs> and Karen's like, give me some money. I'll do it. <laughs> I'll go on your behalf. Send me. I'm willing. Okay. But, but what am I saying? Listen, this, is, this comes to this performance thing. After all Jesus did for you, he rose from the dead. Can't you even get out of bed early and pray for an hour? Because God has shown you so much grace, the least you can do is give your life away to him and go on the mission field. Not because God called you, but because Jesus has died for you. I've heard these preaching. The, late, the least you could do is die in a malaria-filled swamp preaching the gospel. That's the least you could do to show how thankful you are to God. Anybody heard that before? Eh, it's all logical. Surely I can think him by doing better than I did before. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? Surely I would be able to do better now. I mean, I am no longer under the power of sin. Sin no longer has dominion, so surely I should be able to do better than I did before. And if you join the church, of which there's many styles and brands, we're probably presented with a new set of rules. Every church has their rules, some written and some unwritten. Oh, yeah, you know those rules. <sighs> Listen, we're all growing in Revelation. We're all doing the best we can as churches. But I'm telling you something. If we don't get out from underneath the law, we're never going to find the freedom that we're supposed to have to be Christ-like. The rules. The rules can be anything from you must go to the, can't go to the movies, can't drink wine, all the way to ladies must not braid their hair, you must not wear makeup, even if you need it, you weren't allowed to. Listen, we went to a church that we didn't allow makeup, and I'm thinking, Lord, we need to change that rule. There's some crazy woman that needs some makeup. <laughs> Girls can't wear pants, you have to wear a suit and dress it. And a suit and tie to dress because God expects your best. Susie and I have broken all of those rules. She wears a shirt with no, no shoulders now. Ah! Oh! <laughs> yes, I will not cover thy wife's shoulders. That's good, Rodney. Thank you very much. All right, 15 minutes of Bible reading, 15 minutes prayer every day. And we, we did all of our things hoping that God was really pleased with us because he he had listened to us for half an hour and we would grow if we did not do our devotion time we felt if we did our devotion time we felt good about ourselves spiritually if we didn't we felt lousy anybody been there and then there's fasting surely God would be well pleased with me if I fast fasting is like master level Christianity listen Dude, and I'm a faster. I've done, I've done six 40-day water-only fast. Okay, but listen, I, I've ha I could tell you that all of those that I entered into was not on my, my behalf. 
So I'm like, you want me to put that up there? Yeah, because some people use fasting as a performance base. If it's not an invitation from the Holy Ghost, go eat. Quit being grouchy. I mean, I mean, I remember when I made my kids fast and that they were they were hungry and they were grouchy and 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 it just proved how much they loved me. It's like, dude, go eat something. You grouch. You know, that's not what it's about. No, I never made my kids fast. <laughs> yeah, I, I did. I wouldn't let Susie have a day off work unless she was going to a Bible study. I've repented. Now she doesn't work at all. <laughs> you know, there's balance to this thing. <laughs> <laughs> she is the living <laughs> I would go without meals and do and do without dessert to show how much I love God. <laughs> I preach that he I appreciate what he did and I want to grow and become mature. Oh, if you really want to please God, you've got to go out and be a witness. If you <laughs> you arm yourself with pocket full of tracks and giant Bible and you're willing to win the world for Christ. Been there, done that. We're trusting our ability to keep the rules to obey the law. The rules, whether they are in the Bible or added to by the traditions of men, are over hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of years. Whatever the rules may be, we are trusting in our ability to keep the rules. You're trusting in your ability to keep the rules. We've we've gone back to the definition of the law, which is God requiring of me what I do as I do something for him. And we can judge our spiritual maturity before God's based on our ability to keep the rules. Who am I preaching to today? Is it just me? If you keep all the rules, then you must be, a, be spiritually mature. Our behavior is the way in which we are judged in Christ or out of Christ. Your behavior is the way in which you are judged as in Christ or out of Christ. If you begin to lax in the rules, then we bring in a word that is not found in the New Testament called backsliding. It is never a word in the New Covenant. It is only in the Old Covenant and referred to nations, not individuals. But we use it all the time. Man, I think that brother's backsliding. Why? Because he's not following the rules. It is a great word to bring condemnation to those who are not keeping the rules perfectly. (laughs) So you are backsliding. You're not keeping the rules good enough. I I talked to you about that last week, Rodney. The message I heard growing up could be summed up in this. You're not doing enough. You need to try harder and do better. Of course, this produces hypocrisy very quickly. It becomes rapidly clear that you cannot keep the rules. Why? Because the law is always working. (laughs) You discover that whatever you learned in Romans 6 is not working. (laughs) Sin shall not have dominion over you. Oh, really? I can't keep the rules. And I find out that I'm losing my... (laughs) I find out that I'm losing my patience. I'm going to really try now because I want to please Jesus. Have you ever become impatient that you're losing your patience? (laughs) That's bad, man. I, here's a one. I, when you're angry that you're getting angry. <laughs> now, that's real anger. I'm so angry that I'm getting angry. <laughs> I can't quit being angry. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing at me, but you all know who it is. <laughs> this is what Paul was saying. This poor man is now getting desperate because he really does want to be like Jesus. I remember when I read my Bible just for the enjoyment of it and sometimes missed a day was no big deal. <laughs> then you would ask, have you had your quiet time today? <laughs> Crap, listen. <laughs> listen, I'm throwing myself under the bus. I have to keep you accountable. Translation, I'm here to enforce the rules and bring condemnation on you until I, till, till you do not because you do not do them perfectly. 
I'm not here to help you grow or follow through on your intentions. I'm here to remind you how short you're falling. That's what accountability in so many places are. I'm not against accountability, and you guys know that. But, you, but am I holding you accountable to the law, or am I holding you accountable to the Spirit? See, if I hold you accountable to the Spirit, the law will take care of itself. But if I become legalistic about it, you're going to resist me. Why? Because the law always tells you you don't add up. But the Spirit says, I've done it for you. So hold you accountable to the Spirit, not the rules. Are you following the Spirit? Are you? Ah, you broke some rules. Ah, we're not under the rules. So I'm, I'm a man of law. Law of the Spirit. Not the letter of the law, the law of the Spirit. How long did you read your Bible today? I don't know. Didn't have a stopwatch. You have to got, you got to be disciplined. So I went along with what I was told. And so I would read my Bible for 60 minutes every day. It was like the Bible turned into sand in my mouth, and I was bored to tears. You ever tried reading some of the Leviticus? <laughs> I would, hey, I want to confess something publicly. I have not read the Bible entirely. I haven't made it through it. I've tried, but the law told me I couldn't do it. So I, be, I, I just, I can't do it. I, I can't do it. It is not written in redneck language. This begotten stuff just got me. Somebody, on, I could see my sister going, he's, he's a preacher. He hasn't read his Bible. Well, because that's what mom, mom told us. Yeah. Stay in the Word. Stay in the Word. I am. I can't read it, though. Ah, I could visit God all day long until someone said that I had to have my quiet time. When it was like visiting hours, <laughs> then it's like visiting hours with God. You know, they have visiting hours in hospitals. I pray and pray all around the world. I look at my watch, and it's three minutes have gone by. I prayed through Europe in three minutes. <laughs> That's <like before> the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is the law? What is it trying? It, it, that, it, that is the law. That is you trying to please God. It doesn't work. You end up crying out, oh, wretched man that I am. And then comes all of the rededications. <laughs> <laughs> and rededications <laughs> more promises and more promises come on man see see i realized something in 1993 i finally surrendered i finally surrendered and and i was desperate for the living god with power i knelt down at a pool table and i said if you're the god of my mother she said you had power if you have enough power you'll give me a new heart but i am not walking the aisle anymore I'm not going to go rededicate my life. I'm not going to make another promise that I can't fill. But if you're that God and you have the ability to give me a new heart, and you give me a new heart because I'm a lion, cheating, whoremonger, you listed them. I said, I need a new heart. If you give me a new heart, I'll serve you. And boom, he did. And the first thing I said is like, wow, you love me. And he gave me all these things. And then he said, I want you to go to church. I'm like, no, no, don't want to go to them, them, them hypocrites. They're mean, and the Pentecostals are mean in two languages. <laughs> no. Susie's like, I hate that joke. I've heard it so many times. Well, you need to be it. <laughs> more promises, more promises, more promises. I will keep the rules. I will keep the law. I will draw all my natural strength. I will draw on all my natural strength to show God that I'm very grateful for what he's done. I've heard it so many times. If only I could be stronger, more disciplined, that's what I need to do. Or someone else says, I'm praying, uh, I'm praying tonight and day that God will give me more power so I can do his will. Huh. Hmm. <laughs> I got up the other night to pray because that's what I do. So I get up. I don't want to pray in the bedroom because Susie's sleeping and you don't want to wake up the bear. And, and, and so I go out in the living room, and, and, and I, I, I get in my prayer posture. I'm like, Lord, this, I don't really feel like praying. He goes, I didn't call you. I'm like, what? He goes, I didn't call you. I'm like, I'm going back to bed. 
this, the rule said get up and pray at 3 because that's when the witches and the demons are working. It's 3, so let's just do some demon witching work. No, go to bed. Go to sleep. God is not going to make you any stronger. <laughs> Let me clue you in on his purpose. He is, in fact, going to make you weaker. That good word right there. <laughs> and the reason you are not stronger is because you're not weak enough. Well, this is why the law is there. That even though I am in Christ, even though Christ is in my life, if I draw upon my natural resources to seek to please God, I will fall short and fall back into sin and sin and sin and sin. Is this good? God is not in the business of improving us so that one day we will be able to love, to love like him. Left to ourselves, we will never be able to love like him. The miracle is that he lives his love inside of us. And so for us to, to be alive is not us trying to be like Christ, Jesus or trying to please God. It is Christ living his life in us as us. We don't see it. We don't see it so the law has to come. The law has to come. To do what? The law has to keep showing us that we are weak, weaker than we thought. There's this greater potential for anger in you than you ever dreamed. You are far more impatient than you think you are. And therefore, the whole Christian life results itself in continual glorious weakness. It is weakness embraced that says, God, may you live through me in every way. So it is like Paul saying, when I am weak, then I am, when I am weak, then I am strong. He didn't say, when I am weak, that it will lead to strength. He said, at the very moment of weakness, I am strong. I've learned that I am still learning to embrace my weakness and love it. That's the way that God made me, and that's the way God intended it. You and I are created to be in relationship with God and in him to live and to move and to have our being. Why does the law have nothing to do with the Christian? At the beginning of the chapter of Romans 7, there's an illustration that Paul uses. He gives this a fantasy illustration. Or do you not know, this is verse 1, brothers, that I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is blinding on a person only as long as he lives. It is binding. See, see, if you're not dead, the law will, will bind you up. We're supposed to have freedom in Christ, but we've let the law bind us because we're not dead, because we're not weak enough. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brother, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sin, sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now that we are released from the law, having died to that which led, held us captive, so that we serve a new way of the Spirit and not the old way of the written code. First of all, we all have a husband. We're all the bride of Christ, right? You get to choose your husband. This husband is an absolute perfectionist. He knows exactly what he wants and is very quick to say exactly what he wants. He demands, his demands are endless. From the minute this poor wife opens her eyes until she drifts to sleep, her husband has the demands of absolute perfection. <clears throat> but to fulfill these demands, he gives her no help at all. She is very frustrated about it because all he is, from what he is all demanding. She has to be honest. He's not unreasonable. 
He's, he's right, really. The wife in this illustration is the very opposite of her husband. She is not the picture of perfection. She is extremely clumsy. She trips over everything. Every time she tries to serve him what he wants, she drops it and spills it on him. This poor clumsy woman who has never been able to, been able to do what her husband demands. She meets with her husband on many occasions and makes promises that this time is going to be different. She repents. She rededicates. She quits backsliding. But as soon as she gets up from the chair, she falls over the table and spills it all over the carpet. She can't stand her husband. She just wishes that man would die so she could go marry someone else. Susie, be quiet. <laughs> but the man won't die. Listen to me. The man won't die. The man called law will not die. So she dies. And in another dimension, she marries someone else. And that someone else, his demands are even higher than her first husband. The only difference is he does it all for her. He makes sure that it's all done, that he just loves her and gives her all the ability and adequacies to do what he demands. <clears throat> What's it all about? You and I, in the old age, were married to the law of God. There's no more, there is no more a demanding husband than the law of God. You can't do this. You must do that. You must do this. You must do that. Demands, demands, demands. You can't even please that husband. Wherever you did was wrong, he, you tripped over everything he demanded that he made. Every time he tried to fulfill it was of no use. He lived a life of clumsiness. That's us. We dreamed if only the law would go away, if only the law would die. I'm sorry, the law will never die. Because the law is the expression of God's holiness. Listen to this now. There's nothing wrong with the law at all. The law is beautiful. The law is holy. The law is right. The law is a tenfold manifestation of God's righteousness. The law will not die. So I'm stuck with it. But if the law won't die, we can. And so, united to Jesus in his finished work, we, look, we looked at it 18 times, Romans 6 said die. As Jesus died to the old age, as Jesus takes you and I into himself and exits that age by death, I die to my old husband, the law. And I'm risen again in a new dimension of the, in the body of Christ, the new age, the new man. And in this miracle, we are married to Christ, the new husband. And he does not let, and he does not let down on any of his demands of the law. In fact, his demands are summed up in one word, love, even as God loves. He doesn't just sum it up. He becomes, he, he becomes to us our very life. And being our life expressed love through us and achieves everything in the law has ever. But not by struggling to keep it, but by his life expresses it through us. The law means that God requires something of me. It means that some, some doing on my part must be fulfilled. Then if in Christ we have died to the law, and are now joined to Jesus, it means that we are delivered from doing. That's what it means. We're delivered from doing. I'm now exempt from trying to keep the law. He achieved what it was after in me and through me. I'm delivered from doing. To please God, I do not have to read my Bible every day. To please God, I do not even have to pray every day. To please God, I do not even have to go to church at all. To please God, I do not have to witness to another person. To please God, I do not have to try to keep any of the Ten Commandments. I've been exempt from all doing, and I'm living from a new principle now. Not a principle of law, but a principle of life. Christ has come to live in me. And I have now recognized forever my complete inability to keep the law. 
And so in my helplessness, I live out of the life that is Christ in me. And now I feel that I love to read the Word of God. I don't have to. I want to. And I want to get together with people who have like minds who praise God. I discovered that there is raising within me daily, hourly, praise and prayer to God. In fact, my life becomes prayer. There are times when I want to shut the door for an hour. To, <clears throat> I suppose some may call it a quiet time. There are times when I want to fast, but I don't. I don't have to, but I want to. Why? Because it's an invitation. It's not a rule. Instead of trying to keep the law, I now found that there is one person inside of me, and he is love. He expresses himself through me in love, and that is what the law was after all of the time. The law is not achieving by me trying to achieve it. It is achieved by another just being himself in me and through me. I do not understand. Do you understand what I'm getting at here? In this new age, in this body of Christ, it is not a matter of what we do for God. The whole thing in us living helplessly out of another who is our life. Romans 13, 8, where we talks about the same thing in another context. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet it. And any other commandments are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does, does no wrong to his neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling the law. Love is the fulfillment of the law. So if we can walk in love, we're not living under the law. And you cannot walk in that kind of love without understanding the embracement of the Spirit. When I say that there is no longer to do with the law, I want you to understand exactly what I mean. I do not mean that Christ in you strengthens you so that you in his strength can keep the law. When I'm saying Christ in me as my strength, I do not mean that Christ in me strengthens my natural self, my natural resources so that I am now with his strength can, can go keep the law. I don't need to keep the law. What I'm saying is that we forget the law altogether. It has done its work. It has reduced us to, to despair, and, it's, and it, it is over now. Now, Christ in us is love, and that, is with the law, that was what the law was, was after. I look back at those dear people who gave me those rules. Why did you give me these rules? Why did you tell me I had to have a quiet time every time? They really believed that if I did these things, and my love for God and my ability to love God would increase. That's not a wrong motive. But the rules of it became. Why did they tell me to witness? <laughs> so that you, you would learn to love your neighbor, that you'd be desperate, secretly try to keep the rules to achieve love. The Holy Spirit inside of you is the love of God, and spontaneously expresses, expressed and will, will be love for your neighbor and to God. We are living under a new principle. We, we achieve what the rules were after when we achieve it independently from the rules. Let me tell you what's happened with me. I used to walk into a restaurant with my wife, and I would just scan the room, and I would find somebody that God wanted to love, and I would go prophesy. Susie's seen me do it many, many times. Then all of a sudden it became, I wake up in the morning, I'm like, I need to prophesy over somebody. I need to, I need to witness to somebody. And it became the doing instead of the being. There's a difference in waking up or walking into a restaurant going, I need to witness to someone today, and saying, Holy Spirit, the lover in, inside of me, who do you want to love today? See the difference? The law says I must. Love says can we. Is there someone here you need to love today through me? Listen, I, I, I was in the shower this morning, and I got this download and a prophecy for a spiritual brother out in New Mexico. I'm like, I don't even like the guy. I do. That's what God said. God said, I do. I'm like, darn, I miss, guess I'm okay. And here I'm trying to type out a prophecy to him. Why? Because the Holy Ghost is kind of proud of him. And I might need to change my attitude about him. I hope he's not listening. We achieve, we achieve what the rules were after, but we achieve it independently of the rules. 
We put this into practical terms. It means that if you understand what I'm saying, then from now on, you do nothing in order to please God. You understand this is the crux of the matter. I have, I've given up trying to please God, realizing that Christ is my life, is the pleasure of God. Christ being in me is his pleasure. I don't have to do anything to please him. He's already pleased. It used to be that we lived to God, we lived for God. We saw that in order to please God, we had to do something. We had to draw out of our natural self and our natural strength to do something to please God. Now we live from Christ within. So instead of living to or for God, we're living from God. Christianity is not a struggle to become something. It is a choice to let Jesus be. Michael Smith said that. Christianity is not a struggle to become something. It is a choice to let Jesus be. Let me, let me help you out here. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. That part of me that is weak and frail apart from divine influence, apart from the influence of the Spirit, there's nothing good. For I have the desire to do what is right, because I am powerless to do it without Christ. I just didn't have the ability to carry it out when I tried to do my part from completely depending on Christ. For I, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. For now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the death of this body? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Why are we doing what we're doing? Listen. If I'm free from sin and I'm free from the law, that's free. So I said, Lord, Lord, that just sounds too good to be true. He said, well, that's why they call it good news. If I'm free from sin, I'm free from the law, and I don't have to do anything to please God because Christ lives in me. You know what he said to me? <laughs> you have such a poverty mindset, you can't experience freedom. It's a mindset. You, you know, God helps those who help themselves. Really? Show me that scripture. It's not in there. He either did it all and lives in me and wants to live through me, or he doesn't. This is the basics. As we as a church realize we're free from sin, he's taken took sin out of us, and that we don't have to do it because of the rules to please him, and we recognize he's already pleased with you. We do it, and he does it through us, with us, and we get to participate. Now it becomes fun. Now it becomes energizing instead of tasking and, 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 and drudgery and, oh, I got to pray another hour. No, you don't. Show up. I'm not against prayer. I need prayer. But listen, I, I, don't put me on a stopwatch. Let me tell you something. I figured out I pray, I pray all the time. I communicate all the time. Why would you want to put me down to a quiet time and eliminate my relationship? I've done more studying. I've done more studying in, in, the, in the last three or four weeks on stuff. Why? Because God is revealing some stuff that he's calling me to do. He's asking me to do. He wants to do it through me, and he's saying crazy stuff to me. Crazy stuff. And guess what I'm doing? I'm getting in my Bible. Why? Because when I say crazy stuff, I better be able to back it up. So now I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about reading my Bible again. Why? Because there's some nuggets and some gold truths and some things in here. Listen, when God tells me that when, 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 when Hugh Hefner, he was a prince and a king of the porn business, and, and Billy Graham was a prince and a king of the gospel, that when they died, there was a seed that was in the ground, and God says, I'm going to take over. And I'm like, well, okay, that's great. That's wonderful. 
And Psalms 146 jumps off the page, and I start reading it with something. There's some juice on this. What's the juice? It says when a prince dies and goes to the ground, and his breath is there, and he talks about setting a captive free and about giving sight back to the blind, getting, you know, recovering blind. I'm like, what are you showing me here? He says, look what I'm going to do. The princes have died. Hugh Hefner died. Billy Graham died. I'm doing something on the earth. What has it got to do with Psalm 146? He says, do the math. Between Hugh Hefner's death and Billy Graham's 146 days. I'm not making a doctrine out of it. I'm going, woohoo, something's here. God's doing something. God's, God's pulling down demonic kingdoms, and he's raising up holy kingdoms. And he just needs someone who believes that I'm not under the law. I'm full of the grace of God. I'm, I'm full of the spirit of God. And I'm not, I can do whatever he says. Kathy Walton sends me this, well, you have so much time with your dad, you might want to listen to this. <laughs> I've listened to that message three times. I will preach it, and I'm not even going to tell you what it is. There's truth in there that's setting me free. There's truth in there that's setting me free. I'm going to a Christian counselor, and she's poking me like a... She's trying to find out what makes me tick. I'm like... What was that? Yeah, performance. I got this high eye personality, this make it all happen thing. But what's the core? Is it to please God or is God already pleased? Got all these prophecies, all these promises, all these things that I'm supposed to do for God. Oh, am I going to do it in my strength or his? I'm not saying get, get lazy. I'm saying find out your motivation. Are you doing it because he lo you, you love him and he loves you, or are you doing it to get loved? Most of you can't love your neighbor because, number one, you don't love yourself. It was significant. I am good. I know he's good, but does he live in me? Guess what? I'm good. Why? Because he said so. You're good. When... <laughs> When Susie's mom, we'd, we'd get into a tussle or whatever, and, and her mom would go, you good, you good, me bad, me bad. <laughs> you good, you good, me bad. No, we're all good. We can have differences of opinion and still walk in love. But I'm telling you, we're going to win some people by walking in love. When the goodness of God comes and, 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 and the, the drudgery of the law, when the law has done its work, and I become weak and not angry? Would I become weak instead of impatient? Would I become weak instead of fearful? Would I become weak instead of aggressive? When your driving goes from 87 to 75? When we become weak, we start trusting. We say we trust in the Lord, but you know what? We trust in our own strength. Too much. The law is going to do its work. My question to you, how fast are you going to let it work? Here's my altar call. Who wants to surrender? Do you realize that's what the altar call is surrender? I see your law. It's perfect and it's holy. And I surrender. It's the Christ in me that's fulfilled the law. And because of the Mr. Love in me, if I love my neighbor, if I love myself, I have now walked out from underneath the weight of the law. And I'm walking in the law of the Spirit. Romans 6, Romans 7. 
We go into three weeks of family dynamics. If we can get six and seven as a spiritual family, get rid of our criticism, our backbiting, our accusatory, our hierarchical, I've arrived, you haven't, and let Christ be Christ within all of us, the family dynamics will change in this house. You know Charlie, our biker guy, we hadn't seen him in a couple weeks. He showed up this morning. He's making some choices. He come up just to, to tell me, I, I, I can't be here today, but I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And, and, and he's, he, I have to have this done. Listen, I want about 16 more of him. Raw. <laughs> he makes me happy. He makes me happy. God's about to partner with the women in the body of Christ in this next season. I'm about to release some things in the next couple of weeks at, up at the gathering. We're about to see the emergement can't get away from it. Religion has done a spiritual hysterectomy to the body of Christ. And without the equipment, it won't reproduce. But God is supernaturally going to heal the body of Christ, put us in order, put us in place. The law has done its job. But the problem is that because of religion, we've let the law do damage. And we're going to bring it into balance. Did you get anything out of this today? Can I pray over you? Because i got to go to Chicago. You might want to pray over some people on an airplane. Stand up. I'm not sitting next to the engine. Put your hand on your heart. Holy Spirit, thank you for taking sin out of me (laughs) and making me a saint. Also, I thank you that I'm not under the law, that the greater law is the law of the Spirit, the law of love. Thank you for empowering me as I become weak. As the law shows me my uh, inabilities, character flaws, whatever it wants to call it, I humbly bend my knee in a weakened state to receive your forgiveness and your empowerment. And I let you love me in that area of my life. Because where I let you love me, you'll heal me and remove the sting of the law because I'll be molded in your image in every dimension. Heal my relationship with you first and foremost. I come out from underneath the law and I say, you are my husband. I choose to marry you because you'll help me. You just won't criticize. You won't put demands that you're unwilling to fulfill through love. Help me do the same to others. Heal my relationships that I have damaged because I consider myself the law. I've used the law in my speech, my attitudes, my unctions. I've even made it sound religious, and I repent. Teach me to love as you love me. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church. 
To know more about us, go to identitychurch.net, where you'll find resources such as a calendar, media, and upcoming events. You may also download an app for your mobile device from the Apple App Store or Google Play. Then from your mobile device, you can hear our messages, read from the Bible, take notes, connect with us on the social media, and even pay your tithe. Again, thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church.